Uh, now, David said I'd be willing to talk about all sorts of things about my novels and my life, and if I do that, none of this book will get read to you today. So uh, um, I thought what I would do is, is I, I do want to say one thing about House of the Deaf, which the title comes from, a, from a, uh, actually it comes from the work of Goya. Uh, if any of you know the painting of Goya, uh, there is a painting of two colossal-sized men fighting to the death. They're both mired in mud up to their knees. It's called Duelo Agaratapos, which means the duel of the clubs. Um, and it's one of the various paintings that Goya painted in his so-called dark period, although it is, not a, it is a fairly brightly lit painting compared to some of the real dark paintings that he, but it's dark in theme because these people are going to kill each other. One person is going to kill the other and neither is going to escape that plight that they that mire their mud in, that mud they're mired in. Um, he, Goya painted these paintings in a summer house that he bought toward the end of his life, in the last 10 or 15 years of his life. And that, was, that house was outside of Madrid, and it was called La Quinta del Sordo. Uh, and what that translates to literally is the country house of the deaf man. Uh, the man who owned the house was deaf, uh, and that was how the house was known. Goya bought it. And then he painted these, these dark paintings about Spain and, and Spanish history and kind of prophetic and demonic paintings, satanic paintings, some of them, the literary satanic characters. And this is one of those paintings. So I took uh, the idea about somehow being in that house of the deaf, not people not being able to hear each other, understand each other, come to a common cause, uh, I took as the title of this book, uh, House of the Deaf. Now, what I do want to say before I go any further about this is that this, I'm a great lover of Spain, a great admirer of Spain. I think it's one of the most progressive countries uh, in the Western world, if not the most, right now. That was not always the case. It was under Franco's rule for 35 or six years. Um, but since Franco died in 75, and Spain's democracy began in 77, it has really flourished and flowered in a remarkable way. I don't want to get too far into that. Except that this presents a fairly dark picture, the House of the Deaf I'm going to be reading from today, and the, the follow-up book that David mentioned, uh, Romancing Spain, which is a memoir, is my fairly bright lyrical take on Spain and represents my feelings about the country, uh, I suppose, better than this one does. Uh, all this, I hope this book has a redemptive core to it. Um, it does, it necessarily gets into some dark stuff, so that needs to be said. Uh, I invite you to read the other book, too, to get the balancing effect here. Um, on two occasions, I ran, as, as a Cornell University uh, professor, I ran the Cornell's uh, junior year abroad program in Spain. I wanted to do this very badly because the, year I, the first year I've spent in Spain, which was 1969-70, I thought I was 29 by that time. I wasn't a kid. but I. I thought of that as the most educational year of my life, just that immersion in a foreign culture and, and, and discovering foreign ways, and just every day seemed uh, I experienced some form of enlightenment, uh, or at least uh, my interest was perked. Uh, I thought I could help students do this, and so I volunteered to go over and, and, and run that program on two occasions. On the first of those occasions, we were in Madrid, actually in both the occasions in Madrid, but I'm thinking about the first one now, where we had a kind of an indoctrination period before the program moved down to Seville, where it was located. Uh, there was a park. Uh, the students took a crash course in Spanish and a course in Spanish history and so forth. Uh, but there was a park close by the dorm where we lived uh, that we would jog around, students and I. Uh, and a couple of years after we left, the, after that, after that year I, I, I directed the program, I happened to be reading a Spanish paper. An American was killed jogging around that park. An American man, nothing to do with a, an abroad program that I know of. Uh, but the, the park, in front of the park, there was a, a, a sort of a headquarters or a barracks for the Guardia Civil or the, or the Civil Guard, which uh, uh, under Franco, at least, was a kind of a, a prime target for the Basque separatist. Uh, they had planted the bomb uh, and it had gone off and accidentally killed an American, an American running around it. Uh, at the moment I read that, I wondered, this is how the book began, I wondered what it would be like to, to be the director of an abroad program as I had been uh, and for that 
person to have been a student. And what if I were, you know, what if I were approached by the parents of that student who had been killed? Uh, and how would I account for that? I mean, how would I explain? How would I account for the country? What would I say? How would I react? Uh, I didn't make my main character of the, of the novel uh, a program director. I made him uh, a parent who comes in search of those answers, as David mentioned. He's a man who, who came, came from Lexington, Kentucky, middle-aged man. Comes over sometime after the, the um, um, the killing occurs two years and a half, looking for clarification, not looking so much for revenge, although it might, it might move in that direction later on, uh, and confronts the program director, who was the same director who had been there earlier. Uh, the book, half of the book is narrated, or at least seen through his point of view, or restricted third person point of view. The other half is seen from the point of view of the surviving daughter, that is the sister of the girl who was killed. Uh, and it goes back and forth. She's a 21-year-old college student uh, who eventually comes out looking for her father, worried about her father, also at odds with herself and uh, at odds with everything around her, suffering the death of her sister and what that all means to her. Uh, and they kind of approach a meeting in Spain as it moves toward the Basque country. Uh, now, the title of the, of the presentation today was The Human Face of Terrorism. Uh, that's a redundancy. Acts of terrorism are committed by human beings. They are not committed by embodiments of evil. They're committed by human beings, misguided from various points of view, surely. Uh, but it does not help, it seems to me, to drive things to such absolute extremes that we have no idea who we're talking about. And we try to examine, and when we try to examine the reason, the reasoning, motivation, the dedication that some of these uh, so-called terrorists exhibit. In the case of the Basques in Spain, this is very difficult because during Franco's reign, I don't want to get too deeply into history, we'll never get into the book, uh, but during Franco's reign, which as I say, lasted a long time, and it was a dictatorship that the Americans, not the only one, helped to keep intact because Franco presented a kind of bulwark to communism. Um, during that time, the Basques rebelled against Franco, uh, and eventually, actually in 1959, when Eisenhower came over and actually embraced Franco, uh, Eisenhower being the commander of the, gen of the Allied forces and they who had rid the continent of every fascist dictator except Francisco Franco, um, this, this vast separatist movement began. Uh, and many Spaniards and many, uh, many Europeans and many Americans came to sympathize with these Basques, admire them, regard them as somewhat heroic. Uh, because they were taking on Franco when other parts of Spain weren't. Their tactics, obviously, when they veered over toward terrorism, were not accepted. But there was a kind of, a kind of, uh, of uh, an admiration for these people, uh, hedged in with all sorts of qualifications. When Spain became a democracy in 1977, many of these Basques, members of this separatist organization, were too set in their ways, families were too set in their ways. This family was, this, this sort of, this, this participation was being handed on from father to son and daughter too. Uh, and it didn't really change. It just continued on, even though, uh, even though the Basque country at this time had a lot of autonomy, much more than they'd ever had in their entire history, going all the way back into the Middle Ages. Uh, then public opinion began to shift against the Basques but never entirely getting over that lingering sort of admiration that once existed for these people. This obviously complicates their position in history. Uh, it, makes, it makes your response to them a complicated response. You abhor some of their tactics, but you remember how they'd been provoked into it and what they kept going when Franco was ruling that country militarily. Uh, I thought I'd take up, read a little bit, as Ben Williamson, this is this man's name, uh, begins to try to refamiliarize himself with that Basque movement, something he had a dim memory of but had forgotten. Uh, let me see if I can find the right place here. Some of you, some of you all probably will remember this. Some others, this will be entirely new to, to you. Memory began, Ben believed, in 1970, his first year in college. In addition to all the civil rights turmoil and information and misinformation coming out of Vietnam, 
he vaguely remembered something about a trial of ETA activists in the Castilian city of Burgos. Now, ETA is the, is the name of the initials for the, uh, this vast separatist organization. Uh, it comes from their language, which I'll later on give to you. The books he read at his daughter's university would tell him that the exact number of activists was 16, that two were priests and several more ex-seminarians. There were two women. One of the defense attorneys managed to get on the record that Spanish police had tortured his client, and with the court looking on, scars were displayed. Before they were banned from the proceedings, members of the international press got the word out. Nevertheless, all, si all 16 ETA members were found guilty and three were sentenced to death. A general strike followed in the Basque country. Sympathy strikes were called in various countries. Dockers refused to unload Spanish ships. There was an act of self-immolation. Reading brought it back to him. He began to recall his first impression of Etta, and it was of bravery and the heroism of self-sacrifice and the glorious legitimacy of their claim to self-determination and even of their special character, something of their larger-than-life, mountain-rimmed apartness, as if the Basques really were a tribe of superior beings, strong, noble, and steadfast, down through the years, licensed in the way inferior beings weren't, in a manner of speaking, pure. He remembered the Basques and Etta, and then he forgot about them. Later, he'd hear something about a bomb going off in a supermarket, killing dozens, and a news report that stuck with him for a while about a woman out walking with her five-year-old daughter who was identified as a disaffected ETA activist and was gunned down by her erstwhile companions, com comrades, with her daughter looking on. That image stuck with him for a while, and then he forgot it too. He assumed the people that had killed that woman and bombed that supermarket and the people who'd opposed Franco and to whose cause he'd once thrilled were not the same. The truth was, he forgot, he forgot them all. He didn't know if Etta had succeeded in its intentions or not, or if it had gotten the best deal, if it had gotten the best deal it could, and like everybody else in this impure world, had compromised. In other words, and then he, his daughter goes to study in Spain in one of these abroad programs, uh, and Ben continues his meditations on Etta and his reading, and comes to this conclusion. In the ultimate analysis, Etta's quests no longer corresponded to political realities, but to psychological needs. A Basque's need for a grievance was as elemental as his need for water and air. The psychological gave way to the spiritual, the mystical. There was, it was claimed, a sacramental side to Etta's violence. In addition to provoking the average man's outrage, each death achieved a moment's transcendence. All the deaths together aspired to some sort of collective transcendence there on a Basque mountaintop. They expressed a violent yearning for God. Ben had read that. That massive supermarket bombing he vaguely recalled had taken place in a hypercord in Barcelona. Twenty-three had died. That woman out walking with her five-year-old daughter was named Dolores Gonzalez, Catarain. Her nickname was Yoyes. Her hometown was Ordizia, province of Guipuzca. Etta had executed her in front of her daughter not because she had informed on them or betrayed the cause. She had just wanted to quit. He'd read until he couldn't anymore. Then he had flown to Spain. And that's when he goes looking for, for the answers. Uh, behind, he's left his, as I say, the other narrator of this book. Her name is Annie. She's two years younger than the, her sister, whose name was Michelle, uh, who was killed in the bombing. Uh, and Annie is having a hard time. She's having a hard time with her sister's death for her own, own reason to go on. Uh, I'm going to read you a brief scene that takes place on a college campus where she's sitting in an arts quad, uh, a quad such as this, perhaps, if it had a big oak tree out in the middle of it, where she's sitting uh, next to. Um, and, and brooding on what this all means, my sister's death, and what this act of terrorism, the, the changes it's produced in her life. Uh, she's just been in a history course. She's stepped out of the course of the class. She hasn't seen it to the end. Uh, Annie, Annie was a love on this lovely spring day. 
tall, graceful as a dancer, warm complexioned, tints of auburn in her hair. She wore no makeup. Her lips, her eyes were dark, but not bold, not forbidding. They scared nobody away. Lips moist, teeth white, the face of somebody who laughed. She had started to cry. She went and sat in the obscuring shade of an arts quad oak. Curiously, she would never blamed the people who had set the bomb and denied her another chance to get to know her sister. In her art history class, she'd learned that the cornices of buildings built three and four hundred years ago were falling all over Europe. Pedestrians were sometimes killed. The old world was crumbling, and those who frequented its streets ran the risk of falling with it. That was what had happened to her sister. The old world had fallen on her. The old world was more dangerous in that way than the new, but this oak could fall too. If it did, she would join her sister, and then her father would have no one left. Her thought had taken a turn. Life and death were such fragile, flickering things, such whims of the moment, such accidents, that all the records we kept of them were the biggest joke of all. We recorded history to keep from laughing out of sheer, terrified disbelief at ourselves. This oak, for instance, made mockery of anyone who sat with her back to it pondering the meaning of life and of what belonged to whom. My life belongs to me. Then, poof, what life, what you? The oak had been planted when they cleared the arts quad of its goats and cows. That had been at least 120 years ago. It had seen how many generations of students into the grave, administrators, trustees, presidents, and the university owned it. She laughed inside on a deeper register. Someone sitting at her side might have heard it as a growl. It would be an honor to be killed by this oak tree, she thought. Just to be worthy of this oak tree's attention would be an honor. This noble oak, sprung from a tiny acorn, what a joke. Its bark hurt her back. She pressed against it, mortifying the flesh, as monks and nuns and other religious fanatics did when they failed to have God's attention. Her tears had dried, and, the eyes of, and her eyes felt parched with the heat of an unaccustomed anger. She remembered something her sister had told her that suited her mood. They were in Michelle's bedroom, where Annie had gone to return a sweater she'd not really had permission to wear and which didn't fit her in the first place. She was two years younger than her sister, but had experienced a gangly spurt of growth and was already taller. Michelle accused Annie of having taken the sweater without her permission, and Annie defiantly put it back on and showed Michelle how woefully short it was in the arms. In her memory, it barely came to her forearms. It was tight in the shoulders. Buttoned up, it made it hard to breathe. It was some pale, indeterminate color between beige, tan, gray, and green, and quite simply, it was like being wrapped up in her sister's skin. Annie took it off and flung it on the bed. She stood there with her superior stature to see what her sister would do. Michelle took her time hanging the sweater back up in the closet. Then she turned and said, you know what you are. Annie didn't, but she knew not to bite at her sister's question. You're their backup daughter. You know what that means? You're the daughter they've got left over in case something happens to me. The backup daughter, she repeated in a quieter, more private voice, clearly savoring the phrase. It wasn't her sister's meanness. Annie was used to that. It was the private pleasure Michelle took that caused Annie to lash out. That's just you. That's just something you'd like to hear yourself say. Still savoring her pleasure, Michelle said, I didn't say it. Mother did. Mother was ready to stop with me, but Dad talked her having, into having you, just in case. Then Michelle turned to her closet and ran her hand along the clothes. There's nothing in here that fits a backup daughter. Try the Salvation Army or someplace like that. Annie didn't doubt the phrase originated with her mother. She could hear her mother saying it now. Michelle could be forgiven in that uncaring age when she could be expected to latch on to anything with an authoritative ring. But the sentiment Annie recognized is coming from her father, the foreboding. The world could crush you, an old world cornice or a new world oak, and suddenly you would have nothing left. 
He no longer had Michelle, and he no longer had his wife. He had her, Annie, his backup. He would not have put it that way. He would have said, please give me more life. It's, this is the kind of the point of departure for, this is the second, first chapter that Annie appears in. And this is how these two characters begin their movement towards Spain and toward trying, looking for some sort of resolution and understanding. Uh, there's a lot I could read to you from their, their experience in Spain to give you a sense of how they confront this. I'm going to have to cut things a little bit short here. Uh, ben goes and talks to, he goes and talks to the uh, program director uh, who explains to him that there, they, in these bombings, uh, these ETA bombings, you know, it, culprits aren't caught usually. I mean, they're, they're, they're commandos, they're teams that come into Madrid and do this and they leave. The, the government tries to claim occasionally they've actually caught the one who planted the bomb, but this is a kind of a, uh, a pretense on the government's part. Uh, it's the facelessness of it all that gets Ben Williamson. So, of course, he begins to look for a face. And one of the motifs that passes through this book is this search for the face that somehow will be the face of the, of the man or the woman or somebody uh, who caused his daughter's death. You're looking in the, in the newspapers, in the te on the television, people, people passing by him. I'll read you a, a little, ex little sample of this search for the face which occurs in a newspaper uh, to give you a, a taste of the state of mind that he's in and how he's observing the world around him. Uh, actually, two faces. They belong to a man and woman just arrested in France. He's seeing these in the newspaper in Spain. They were identified as ETA veterans who had risen through the ranks and come to occupy leadership roles. In addition to being collaborators in terror, they were sentimentally linked, in quotes. Before they had established themselves in France, they had active roles in various commandos in Spain. The man especially had had a sanguinary career with nine assassinations, among them a Supreme Court judge held against his name. She, it appeared, was his helpmate. At a certain point, they disappeared and reappeared in France, where they'd become first lieutenants to an ETA leader nicknamed Chapote, who processed the information he received from Spain and then sent word back to the various commandos. These are the people you are to kill, X, Y, and Z, for reasons we have deemed sufficient. When Chapote was arrested, this couple took his place. They received the information, the intelligence from on the ground. They made the final decisions. This month, it's this X, this Y, and this Z. There's a civil guard headquarters fronting a park in Madrid. There'll be a young guard out patrolling. An American student will be running by. There may be others, X, Y, and Z. Ben couldn't be sure of the dates. More likely than not, it had been Chapote who had issued the order to attack that civil guard headquarters. This couple had equally unpronounceable Basque last names. He studied the faces. The photograph of the man was clearer, better defined. He was in his mid-30s now, and the face was fleshing out. The nose looked slightly swollen and out of line. There was a sinister look about the lower lip, a faint gleam that led to the darker gleam of the eyes, one of which, the right, was narrowed. Over the widened left eye, the brow was raised. It was a look that said, I've seen you, I've pronounced your name, I've put you on my list. The woman's face was slightly blurred. Her hair was disheveled, thick as a pelt. It half covered her forehead in spiky black curls. Her eyes were open wide and staring directly into the camera. Round eyes, straight nose, closed mouth, a chin softened in its line. She wore a necklace of some sort with a large heart-shaped pendant, perhaps made of wood. She wasn't talking. She was pictured beside the man who said all he needed to with his sinister, straight-ahead look. The woman looked like a heedless girl who had been lured into following the man. Ben looked at her hard and said, you and your man killed my daughter. They hadn't killed his daughter. They, hadn't prob they, they probably hadn't even issued the order. Anyway, the French had them. They faced charges first in France, and only after serving their sentences there could they be extradited to Spain, where they'd serve much longer sentences. If they were ever freed, they'd be unrecognizable. This might be the last time anybody would see them 
side by side. That's just to give you a taste. He does this on and on and on until eventually he sees a man uh, on television to begin with and then in, in, in the newspaper. And finally, he begins to see him around, he thinks he's seeing him around, walking around Madrid, uh, and fixes on this particular person. Uh, there's a lot that goes on in this book. He begins to have an affair with an American woman who sympathizes with him, uh, but the intensity is building, and eventually Ben snaps and goes looking for this particular man in the Basque country. Uh, by this time, his daughter is coming along uh, behind him, uh, I'd like to be able to read you more passages from her. I don't think there's really enough time. So what I think I'll do is, is, is read you a passage of Ben Williamson as he goes into the Basque country from Madrid. Much, much of this book is set in Madrid. As I say there are three or four chapters set in, in Lexington, Kentucky. But what I want you to, at least what I want to be, I hope convey to you, is the complexity of this whole issue of, about this this so-called terrorism and this vast separatist movement and who is guilty of what, who owes whom what. Uh, ben Williamson now has entered the, the Basque capital, which is called in its Castilian uh, usage, uh, Vitoria. Has anyone been there? Actually a beautiful city, uh, Vitoria. Uh, but it, it has a Basque name also. All these, all these Basque towns have both Castilian or Spanish. Uh, and Basque names, uh, and he begins to explore a street which has, which has a, a distinct Basque air to it, and I'll pick it up right there. He entered another street, Calea, Calea is the Basque word for street, Calle would be the Spanish word for street. He entered another street, Calea Cucheria, Calea must have been the Basque word for street, but the signs and banners he saw hung there with all their X's, Z's, G's, and T's were unintelligible to him. This was a poorer, more dimly lit street, built on a gradual decline. It was lined with bars and inexpensive restaurants and one-room groceries. Most of the bars had a garish discotheque lighting, but there were others, bars that were plainly lit, hard-edged, and seemed to give off an uncompromising chill. Some had photographs in the windows of young Basque men and women, under each, under each of which a name was printed and a date in the past. He recognized these faces. They weren't the mugshots he'd seen in the newspapers, but they stared straight ahead out of eyes that might never have blinked. Whatever mercy they revealed was reserved for a future date. Outside one of these bars, he stood reading a notice posted beside the door, written in both Spanish and Basque. The notice informed him that this was an establishment that valued free speech, and that lately police had been entering with the express purpose of denying patrons that privilege. In passing, they ripped down posters and subjected customers and management to various kinds of abuse. He entered. Posters were still up. Perhaps the police hadn't been here in a while. There was a large composite photograph on the wall to his right made up of 29 small photographs. He counted them. One was of a young woman with her head thrown back. She appeared to be laughing. A breeze appeared to be blowing her dark hair. Five of the 29 had a black slash across them and the word extean, whatever, how you pronounce that, written there dead, he assumed, or maybe disgraced. Two young women were sitting in, in back at the bar. They were speaking a language that seemed rough-hewn from the air. The only other patrons, a man and a woman in a, booth, uh, in a booth in the front room, looked as if they were keeping some sadness to themselves, perhaps a, part, a parting. The bartender, a young man, served Ben his glass of wine. Ben alluded to the notice outside and asked the bartender what it was the police did, the abuses, what was the worst, and the young man nodded, as if this thoughtfully inquiring tourist who might have been undercover police himself had come to the right place. They torture us for our beliefs, he said. They don't want us to look like ourselves because we stand for everything they don't. And when they look at us, they see their shame, so they do that and he directed his patron's attention to the poster on the wall at his back. 
It was another composite that made up of only three photographs and all of the same man. The before was of a round-faced boy of perhaps 20, with an alert and unwavering but undefiant gaze. He wore a striped collarless shirt buttoned to the top. His neck was unmarked. There were two after photographs. In the first, the boy wore a neck brace and a white shirt or gown of some sort. His face was badly swollen and except for the area around the mouth which had a nocturnal pallor, colored a raspberry red. At first glance, he seemed to be wearing sunglasses. A closer look revealed that the area around his eyes had been beaten black and that the skin had a glossy sheen easy to mistake for glass. In the third photograph, the back of this boy's head was pictured and a sizable chunk of his hair had been ripped down to the white of the scalp. This boy had a name, Unai Romano. The Basque word for torture was a borrowing, as if the concept was meaningless until the Spanish came along, torturac. The text continued in Spanish, a hundred prisoners were tortured this year alone. After seeing this, what are you going to do? A tourist of tortured Basque prisoners. This is a little refrain that runs through this part of the book. Ben asked, this Unai Romano, what did he do? What did they accuse him of doing? The bartender shook his head. Of belonging to a subversive organization, he said, Una Banda Armada. They do that and think we won't recognize ourselves. One day they'll do that to me. The civil guard, the bartender nodded. The Spanish police, the, national, the Spanish national police too, the Basque police, our own police torture us. As soon as you cross the border, the French police. They all take their turns. They're like occupying armies competing to see who can do the most harm. Etta, Ben said. The bartender smiled. Etta didn't protect him. Ben signaled over his back to an eye Romano, bruised beyond recognition. The bartender smiled. How do you know I'm not police, Ben asked. I watched you reading our notice beside the door. I saw you looking at the faces in the photographs, those of us who were in Spanish prisons. I saw the way you looked at them. The bartender gestured to the girls. And I saw the way you looked at me. You're not police, you're someone else. Who? Ben was keenly curious in that moment. Someone who wants to know the truth. A hundred prisoners tortured this last year is a very round number. What if it's a lie? What if it's only him, Unai Romano? It's not. But what if it is? If it is, it's as bad as a hundred. It's a hundred all in one. If it's just one, Ben said, then it won't happen to you. That's what I mean. It will, the bartender said. The bartender was no more than a boy. All right, this is Ben's, and begins to un begin to understand how complicated this whole issue is of, of the terrorism that, uh, and the, you know, the, the revolt against the Spanish state that the Basques were, and Etta were responsible for and that took his daughter's life. Uh, Annie, his, his, his other daughter, is somehow following along behind him. Uh, I think I want to leave some time from questioning, for questioning, so it's questions. So I think I'll read one more scene that takes us even more deeply into the Bass, uh, the Bass country. Well, a couple of old passages. This is Annie, who is seated at a table in a plaza, small plaza, in the town that the that the novel moves toward in the Basque country, uh, just to give you a sense of the state of mind that she's in at this time. Back in the main plaza, she sat at a table and told the waitress to bring her anything, anything she wanted. The waitress bought her a bottle of mineral water, a compliments of the house, saying she, the waitress, a girl approximately Annie's own age with a round face and cute, cute as a Basque button, hoped that improved her day. Annie drank the water with a real thirst, the day still warm, her walk long, and her search fruitless. Every person she saw returning to the plaza after the midday meal looked so satisfied with his lot and fundamentally fulfilled by his Basque being that she couldn't imagine how any more Basqueness could be appealed to 
in the name of whatever separatist cause. She tried to visualize her father among them, and such was the foulness of her mood she couldn't see him at all. She tried picturing him where she'd seen him last, on the campus of her school, and managed only a familiar and heavy-set blur. For a moment, she gave in to a rage at these Basque families who had taken her father away from her. In a small, lucid part of her mind, of course, she blamed only herself. She breathed deeply and let that lucid part expand. In the margin of the light she cast, her father appeared to her, and she saw him as clearly then as she had when, in the candlelight of a restaurant, he told her to dig in for the day that was sure to come. He'd had a naked, an obstinate sort of honesty in his eyes that she'd missed at the time, but caught in retrospect. Back home, she'd laughed and shaken her head at this lover of old ballads. Now she set her jaw and faced him with all the frankness she could muster. She committed her missing father to memory. And finally, as the point of view is moving quickly from Annie back to her father, this again is Annie. His living daughter had drifted out from the ball court. The waitress had gone back inside the cafe. Some time has passed between this scene and the earlier scene with the waitress. A group of kids was gathered under the arcade, but they soon scattered. Annie heard footfalls in the plaza made by people who had disappeared by the time she came to look for them. The town was quiet. If the Plaza Mayor was a stage, the stage was set but it was too big a stage, too centered in the public eye, too resonant with historical occasions, too much a poor end point for all the currents that made up the town, and she was not where she had to be. She stopped and listened. She heard the river, and she heard voices born on the water. If voices got on the river, they might be carried from one end of this mountain rim town to the other, and she had structured her hearing until it was not apartment dwellers with their windows open and their nightly mutterings she heard, but the voices of men relating matters of real import, real consequence, or voices relating their passion's blind folly. Those were the voices the river favored, and those were the voices she heard. Two men, one of them would be her father. Annie was not a fool. If she heard the water making the sounds of two men talking, she heard what she'd come to this town to hear, she quite understood. But if those were the sounds the water made, and if one of the sounds was the voice of her father, what choice did she have? She moved off toward the river. Paula called after her, and then Paula moved with her. The man Ben had addressed as Armando Ordoki, who is the Basque man Ben has been looking for, or perhaps this is the Basque man Ben has been looking for, walked away, paused as though considering his course of action, and then walked partway back so that the two now stood no, no more than five feet apart. The river ran below them. They were in a shadowy walkway that passed just behind a string of offices and stores. The window just upstream gave them a darkened look into a gallery where pictures by local artists hung, pictures of this river and these hills. I will take the time to explain something to you. The man, Armando Ardoki perhaps, announced with professorial forbearance, please listen carefully. I will describe to you a scene that all Basques know. When the, Gu when the Guardia Civil come to take your son or daughter away, they will march you and your wife and younger children outside into the street. More often than not, you will be barefoot perhaps only half clothed. They will insult you and threaten to beat you if you move. They intend to make an example of you. Your neighbors will not take you in because then the Guardia Civil will evict and beat them. You stand outside in the rain and cold and listen to your child's screams. When they finally take him away, they will not let you back into your house, not at once. First, they will ta take all his possessions away in big cardboard boxes before your eyes. His books, his notebooks, his tapes, his posters, his clothes, his toothbrush and hairbrush and razor, everything, his childhood toys if he has any left. When they do let you back inside, you will find your house ransacked and no, tra and no trace of your son left. 
or your daughter. This is how the Spanish state functions. They are scrupulous down to the last detail. They will take your son or daughter to Madrid, and for five days you will have no news of their whereabouts. You will not know if your son or your daughter is alive or dead. The one thing you can be sure of is that he or she will be tortured. Perhaps you have seen the photographs. Yes. You may have opposed what your son or daughter chose to do, but once they have done it, you are part of the fight. Do you understand? You will never forget the night they came for him or for her, for your daughter. They will have violated you too in your innermost being. You think, what a pretty town. Most tourists think our Basque towns are as time, think, think of our Basque towns as timeless. Time here cuts deep. It is like a razor cut. It begins when they come from your child and you stand outside counting the seconds and minutes and hours. You will never know how many families have stood like that, exposed. Armando Ordoki, Ben said. The man stopped talking. He looked at Ben with an alerted curiosity. The flesh flow on his face come to a quivering halt. Ben remembered that Ardoki, as a very young man, had been taken away. It followed that Ardoki's family had stood outside. Um, I'm going to leave it there because there's still some things to go between these two, and I don't want to ruin the outcome of this book for you. Um, but what I did want to point out was the, the two-sidedness of this struggle. Uh, now, if you ask where I stand, I'm a pretty bitter foe of ETA, personally. I think they've, they're, they're locked into a way of being that is suicidal and, uh, you know, violent beyond, it, it, wrong-headed, puts it mildly. Uh, but it's understandable if you think about it. If you, if you see what's the, how, the, how, the, how things have progressed in the Basque country, that doesn't make it excusable, but it makes it understandable and it makes it human. So there's a human side, a human face to terrorism necessarily, or these acts wouldn't be committed. So I'll leave it at that. And take questions if you have them. Any questions? I mean, you have to, it, it go, almost goes without saying, except unfortunately it has to be said. Confronting this threat that we have, and it is a life and death threat, we need to know history. We need to know their history and all of its intimacy, all of its details, its convolutions and so forth, to be able to understand people, to understand, if, that, if it's just to who understand your opponent, understand them, to simply try to say that over there is evil incarnate and we will fight that as we fight evil incarnate will not accomplish anything except emboldening these people. I chose to write about the Basque because I know Spain and, and I know something about the Basque cause and because of what, what I let off saying, because the Basque at one time there was this kind of, this kind of lingering admiration for the Basques and their behavior uh, against Franco, even though it turned senselessly violent later on. And, it, and it's right now, by the way, it, I'm, it looks as if things might be get, beginning to improve. Uh, but sure, we just, I mean, yeah, there's no substitute for understanding, giving as much thought as we can to these people, why they do things, why they do the things they do, what it is they see in us, what it is they see in themselves, the history of oppression, the history of their own, their own oppressing of their own people. I mean, you need to know all of this stuff. I, I, I grant you there would come a time if you knew so much history, you might just be paralyzed by it, immobilized, and think, well, I can't do anything. If I do this, I'm, I'm discounting this part of history. If I do that, I'm discounting that part of history. You obviously eventually have to act. 
but it has to be done with all, with all of your educated wits about you. That's my only point here. And we've been regarding these people as human beings, whether these are human beings, and that's what I tried to do in this book. And I think it has to be done with, with these people too, with Al Qaeda. I don't know those, I don't know that. I do know this, so I went in this direction. We all want Al Qaeda to be stopped and then Laden to be caught and so on. But you could, don't you agree you could have tuned in to the media in this country for the past two or three years and learned absolutely nothing about the background of the whole situation? I remember reading a little bit about Iraq when we first started to invade Iraq. And in the past hundred years, Britain, England, has invaded Iraq three times and conquered Iraq in the past hundred years. And it's been amazing, what, three years since we invaded, I, I bet you, you know, you would never know them. Because we don't, we don't, we just don't discuss them, which is you know, obviously it's something we're here to try to remedy. I know, or even just more recent history. I mean, in the first Gulf War, how many people remember and or have heard that like, Bin Laden asked to be able to invade Saddam Hussein? Bin Laden wanted to lead a force in against Saddam Hussein, and that didn't, you know, that didn't uh, suit certain people's purposes to point out that this was an implacable foe of Saddam Hussein, Bin Laden. So that doesn't, you know, that has to be factored in to understand that man. Bin Laden and why he would do the things he did against us. Horrific things, inexcusable things. Uh, but it needed to be understood. Yeah, it's the British have a keener sense of history. They give more importance to history than we do, I think, sometimes. And they they keep pointing these things out. That, you know, that what did Santayana say? Remember the famous comment about history? Those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it, or something very close to that. And, uh, so that's there, yeah. But I really wanted to write a story in this a book, in this book, not a history lesson. I was hoping that, I hope that's not what it comes across as. Uh, but it relates, it's a father-daughter book, primarily, and, and the way in which these two men, these, this man and this daughter come together, uh, consoling each other for the death of their sister and other daughter. And there's a third woman involved in there, too, another woman involved. But uh, it's, it's you know, we, we live in this climate of terror nowadays. How do you, how do we somehow shore up these personal relations and make them count uh, for more than they perhaps had to earlier. I mean, it's, it's, that's kind of a crude way of putting it, but I think this is, you know, we, 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 we hold on to each other more tightly now in the time of terror. Uh, and I wanted to put two people out there right in the front of it to see how they would come together, that is father and daughter, surviving daughter. This is all a bit in the after after effect. I mean, when you're writing these novels, at least when I write them, I've, I don't have them plotted out chapter by chapter, page by page. I'm kind of feeling my way, but I began to realize that this is what I wanted to do once I got deeply into it, was to bring, to make this kind of father-daughter uh, uh, achievement, father union possible in the book. The mother, the mother divorces him. She says he's, he's stagnating and he's, he, she lost a daughter too, he lost a daughter, all right, but she's not going to take part of his stagnation. Yeah, yeah. That's when Annie says he, he, has, he lost his daughter, he lost his wife, he has no one left except me. He, she meant the divorce, yeah. yeah. Any other questions or comments on this topic? Okay, well, thanks for coming and enjoyed, enjoyed reading to you.